that is what I want to talk about today. It's uh, my great pleasure and honor to, uh, to be able to, to address you. Um, and uh, let's get right into this whole thing. When you hear robot navigation these days, times have changed. People think of robot navigation, that's machine learning. Of course, there are uh, the appropriate places where these issues are addressed. So you see here these, a uh, couple of years ago at SNBC, these people were obviously looking at a bunch of uh, broken equipment. And one says, uh, that was surprisingly easy. How come the robots were fighting, fighting with spears and rocks? And the other says, if you look to historical data, the vast majority of battle winners use pre-modern weaponry. And thanks to machine learning, robot apocalypse was short-lived. So in this talk, I will talk about uh, machine learning, but uh, not machine learning, robot navigation without any machine learning. And let me talk about some serious stuff here because I'm particularly pleased and honored to talk to you about this kind of issue because when you go back in history, this is uh, one of the early uh, important publications about multi-robot coordination. There was no machine learning. There were deep and sophisticated algorithms. And of course, you see that this is closely related to where I have the honor of speaking today. And it turns out that in my master's uh, thesis, I was looking at some, some of these papers. So it's very exciting for me after all this time. And I'm, I'm really, really pleased and honored to see uh, Micha there. So I see him, I cannot hear him. But um, that said, uh, there's more to be, to be done here. Um, so when you look at how things have been changing, and things are changing, got to work with the light as well. Um, here in Braunschweig, people don't just do uh, theory, they also do practice. So when you look at where we are, uh, this is central North Germany. And uh, when you zoom in a little bit, um, you see this is where we are, and this is, um, this is where the city is. And there is this place called Wolfsburg, which actually happens to be uh, the home of the largest car manufacturer in the world. And this is the main factory where the largest number of cars uh, are produced. They produce something like 5,000 cars in this whole building. Uh, raw materials come in at the other end after two days, you get the finished car coming out at the other end, 5,000 a day. So there's a lot of stuff going on about cars. And now, of course, when you um, look into motion of stuff, I'll get that to that in, in uh, um, the next slide. Uh, there's also, you may remember this Rosetta, there's also moving objects not on the ground, but in space. So here's a bunch of colleagues who are involved in a variety of space missions. Uh, so basically, all these space missions, just like the other week, you had this uh, uh, Japanese uh, mission that uh, launched something, some, some uh, probes that were collected. Um, um, there's always some colleagues here who are involved in these kind of missions. Um, here are a bunch more. And we had, we've had a, a, a project together which was combining mobility on the ground and in space. So you see that's an autonomous car. It's actually an electric autonomous car. And you see this guy in the tie, you may recognize that person. Um, there's uh, one of the leading people in Germany on uh, autonomous cars. And here's the colleague who does space. And that's an autonomous vehicle. So autonomous vehicles are really robots on wheels. And I could talk a lot more about this, especially the coordination between them. But um, let me just skip that and, and talk about the development of not just having one object, one robot or one processor, but going to multiple of them. And uh, the first thing is initially these uh, processes were really big, filling rooms. And this is the uh, size of a um, pack of cigarettes. And now they got so small that you can uh, barely see them. I mean, that's a penny for reference. And the same development you've had in the context of robots. So you can think of something from the 50s, steam engine driven, um, just a joke. So this is like 10 years ago, so this size. And now these things get smaller and smaller and smaller. And when you get smaller and smaller, an important part is you get more of them and many of them working together. 
And uh, now something about the dimensions here, and this is something that is important to, to consider when you, when you look at these things. So this kind of thing has a certain size, um, that sort of reference point, and you can uh, move to smaller dimensions and smaller sizes. Smaller sizes, um, so this is a 40th of a millimeter, that's a small microbe, I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, you have many of them and you, you go to smaller and smaller dimensions and moving these objects. At the other extreme, you may have something which is really large, like a huge space station. Of course, that is not a real thing, a hundred miles, that was from one of the Star Wars movies, but this is something that people are thinking about and working on, building these large-scale structures, and we'll get to that in the very end of the talk. Um, now, there's also a third dimension, or if you want to think of that, that axis, that's the second, that's the number, so you can have one, but you can also have many of them and really even more of those. Um, so, for instance, if you look at traffic, that consists of many, many, many cars, many, many objects, and if you consider that autonomous traffic, then you don't want this, so you want coordination between a lot of autonomous objects. Now, there's also um, the issue of the complexity and the computation involved. What are these objects capable of doing? And um, so here's something which I'll skip, but I still show you that there's something about a local coordination between these to achieve some global structure, which is nice, which is good, which is like a Steiner tree. And of course, um, then there's a bit of logic that you can do some computation. And this is something that you'll see uh, shortly in a couple of minutes. Um, so when you look at these sizes and the numbers and the complexity, um, there's something else about logic that ties in together with uh, with a space station. Um, so let's look at dimensions, sizes, and I brought here uh, a particular human that happens to be a meter and a half in size. And as it turns out, this is sort of halfway between uh, something that is really small, like one of these microbes, and something which is relatively big, uh, like a space station. So when you do the math, it's about halfway in terms of uh, orders of magnitude. Of course, that's a bit science fiction, um, but using these as, uh, as robots, that's also a little bit of science fiction. We'll get to this uh, in a moment. These extremes of the dimensions where humans and humanoid robots and cars are sort, sort of halfway, that's also something when you, when you look at a bigger scale, it turns out that a human in terms of uh, orders of magnitude is also halfway between a hydrogen atom and the sun. So reaching out to both of these dimensions is, um, is obviously pushing frontiers. And uh, when you look at large numbers and complex computations, especially computation, there are a couple of things which are important. One is um, whether you are outside of the system or inside of the system. And ironically, when we are here in the middle and you look at these extremes and you try to control something which is really small, it's far away, you cannot really reach down into it, that may not be a hydrogen atom, but maybe it's one really, really small uh, robot that is hard to sort of control. Um, so you're looking for, at it from, from the outside. And if you have something which is really far away, say a, a space probe, you're also far away and, and not in a position to, to really do something in real time because of the speed of light that uh, makes uh, a difference here and that can be a problem. Um, so. Ironically, when, you, when you're looking at this, you're, you're far away, you're doing something, and um, maybe you're getting some data, you're doing some computation, and then you're telling that system what to do. The difference is internal communication, uh, internal computation, sorry, uh, not using the outside communication, because whether it's really small dimensions or larger dimensions, you are far away from it, so you don't have really direct interaction, either because of the speed of light, which makes real-time control difficult, or because it's really difficult to, to reach and to control in these small dimensions. So what you then want to do is enable the system to do things by themselves, more or less autonomously as a system, as a swarm of robots. And uh, 
that gets me to sort of a, a little overview here of the kind of topics that this reaches and I will focus on one in particular. I, I touched, I mentioned this, there will be a little bit of spacecraft later. Uh, I'll skip this, I'll skip, well, controlling massive particle swarms. I have a little clip on this that I'll show you. Um, and uh, the, the main part that I wanted to, uh, to do today between talking to Danny about the contents of the seminar, there has been uh, some news, some development about this computational geometry challenge. So I'll focus on that because that's closely related to that challenge where some people are looking at it practically trying to solve some benchmark instances and so on. Um, and this is something I'll, I'll do as an encore in the very end. All right, so massive particle swarms. You have these really small thingies and you want to navigate that. That's too small to carry an engine or maybe a computer and so on. So what you can actually do is uh, use a, an electromagnet. These microbes here, um, they can be fed with iron laced particles. So then they, they sort of eat that food and then they, they are, have some iron inside and you can control them uh, with an electromagnet. They move around in parallel like this, um, but they are all subject to the same kind of um, forces. And that's where I'll show you a little clip, uh, sort of a summary of that kind of thing. And I hope that all works out. We present progress on the computational universality of swarms of micro or nanoscale robots in complex environments, controlled not by individual navigation, but by a uniform global external force. Swarms of robots, such as this single-celled organism, can be grown or built in large numbers, but are usually controlled by global forces such as a magnetic field. While the motion planning for one robot may be trivial, the problem becomes complex when many robots receive the same motion commands. In the following, we consider a 2D grid world. Here, we are building a large-scale prototype composed of square plexiglass boards that can be assembled together to form a bigger board. In this world, all obstacles and robots are unit size, and for each actuation, robots move maximally until they collide with an obstacle or another robot. We can use these rules to build logic gates. This is a three input OR gate. If at least one robot enters at the top, one robot will exit the bottom. Additional robots are recycled to the side. This is a five input AND gate. If less than five robots enter at the top, no robot will enter the goal location outlined in gray. Only if all five inputs have robots will the goal location be filled. But how can we generate independent choices with global inputs? Here we use a decision tree to set robots true or false. At each stage, the decision only affects one robot. We combine these three elements to prove, by a reduction from 3SAT, the NP hardness of deciding whether we can reach a specific location. Decision trees are used to set each variable true or false. Three input OR gates are used to form each clause, and an M input AND gate provides a conjunction. The goal is only reached if the variables are set so that the formula evaluates to true. Therefore, the motion planning problem with global inputs is at least NP hard. So obstacles make motion planning hard, but obstacles can be a blessing. Without obstacles, we can only move the mean position of a group of robots. No matter what inputs we use, the A remains an A. However, the right set of obstacles enables efficient control of position of every robot in the group. The obstacles here enable matrix permutations in just four input commands. This permutation is an involution, and so by repeating the cycle we can toggle between A and B. Our physical implementation enables matrix permutations in four moves. This prototype uses metal and plastic spheres and reconfigurable black obstacles. Our algorithms prescribe where to place obstacles to achieve arbitrary permutations. Here, a clockwise input sequence toggles the position of the first two robots, but we can encode a second permutation in the counterclockwise direction. The counterclockwise input sequence increments the location of every robot. 
Together, these two generators enable arbitrary permutations of the matrix, allowing us to bubble sort the array. We designed configurations to implement AND, OR, NOR, and NAND logic gates. However, fanout gates turned out to be quite tricky. Fanout gates are necessary for simulating arbitrary digital circuits, such as a half adder. We were able to prove that unit sized robots cannot generate a fanout gate. On the positive side, we resolved the missing component with the help of 2x1 robots, painted white in this prototype. These can create fanout gates that produce multiple copies of the inputs. Using these gates, we are able to establish the full range of computational universality as presented by complex digital circuits. As an example, we connect our logic elements to produce a 3-bit counter. This counter requires three fanout gates, two adders, and one gate for the carry. We have instructions for wiring logic gates together and can actuate all gates and wiring by the same clockwise sequence of commands. Yeah, so that was that part. And let's move on because coordinate motion planning. So there was some coordination between these, but um, of course we are also interested in, in robots that can do a few more things. And like I said, uh, this is something that some of you or many of you may be particularly interested in these times because um, we have started uh, a couple of weeks ago um, the current computational geometry challenge which is working with coordinated motion planning. Um, so it's underway, it started in late November and it will run uh, through the middle of February. Um, we already see that there are some groups of students working on this kind of thing and that is actually related to what I uh, acknowledged in the, in the introduction having multiple objects that can actively, by themselves, uh, move. And uh, when you look at this, here's the timeline, and uh, this will be, uh, the outcomes will be presented at Sausage. Um, and uh, there's a couple of references on that page. So obviously that interest in these couple of references has become a little uh, more intense uh, lately. So what I'll show you is I'll give you a very quick introduction, like the background, the context, the motivation, and the history. And um, then, uh, then I'll go into the details of really, there, there's actually math there, and there are proofs there, and we can show something and, and do some, some actual algorithms and not just videos. But um, let's start with that. <laughs> Simultaneously steering a large number of agents to goal positions is a common challenge, whether you are an ant army trying to defend your home, just trying to get home after work, a densely packed warehouse of robots delivering products to be packed and shipped, or a marching band demonstrating your skills. There are many approaches, ranging from fully distributed solutions to fully centralized methods, such as warehouse robotics, air traffic control, and packet routing. In this work, we present a number of breakthroughs for coordinated motion planning. Our goal is to reconfigure a swarm of labeled convex objects by a combination of parallel, continuous, collision-free translations into a given target arrangement. Problems of this type can be traced back to the classic work of Schwartz and Scherer, who gave a method for deciding the existence of a coordinated motion for a set of disks between obstacles. Their approach is polynomial in the complexity of the obstacles, but exponential in the number of disks. Previous work has largely focused on pipelined sequential schedules 
in which only robots on the perimeter move, with objectives such as minimizing the number of moves. This differs from our objective, which is to minimize the overall time by exploiting parallel motion of many robots. A natural lower bound for the necessary time is given by the maximum distance from a start to a target location, the ratio between the achieved overall time and this maximum distance is called the stretch of a schedule. When is it possible to limit the stretch and achieve good schedules? That is the focus of this work. First of all, finding a reconfiguration plan with minimal execution is NP hard, even for a grid arrangement without any stationary obstacles. Here are various parts of the construction. See our full paper for details. Before we start with our algorithm, let us take a closer look at possible ways of rearranging robots. Because robot collisions are not allowed, direct swaps of adjacent robots are impossible. However, we can rearrange whole cycles of robots by moving them simultaneously. Combining several cyclic one-step moves within a six-pack substructure we can achieve a swap of neighboring robots. These swaps can be performed in parallel for disjoint six-packs. There is a total of 12 different classes of six-packs, so a set of disjoint swap operations can be realized by a constant number of parallel rotation steps. Now let's consider a starting configuration that we want to rearrange into this target arrangement. Making use of the parallel local swaps, we can apply the parallel rotate sort algorithm of Marberg and Gaffney from 1988. Rotate sort achieves a runtime that is linear in the size of the perimeter of the bounding box. However, this does not achieve constant stretch if the maximum distance is small compared to the perimeter, so we need more refined algorithmic ideas. So, that was the intro, the preliminaries, the technical setup, and now let me run you through a few more details of how we actually achieve this objective of constant stretch. And of course, constant stretch is also an approximation algorithm, but uh, it's also more because it's within a constant of this lower bound um, of the direct distance uh, unobstructed. So you have this set of origin destinations paired just like in the instances for the challenge. And um, here's the thing. Um, we can do some things here on the large scale. So we can do these swap operations that you just saw in, in sort of the, uh, uh, the trailer um, in some ways which are uh, O of size of this whole grid. However, the distances between the original distances between origin destinations between these robots may be much smaller than the size of this whole grid. Uh, which means doing something which uh, achieves a make span, a schedule of the length, which is the size of that whole grid, would not necessarily be within a constant. And that's where we have to do a few more tricks. Um, so there's something about within these cells, and there's something to transfer uh, between the cells. Now, what you just saw about these local swaps in these different classes, we can do something, we can use uh, known strategies, but what we also need to do is get things into the right cells so that we can do something inside of each cell and do that separately. Um, so, so that's where we need some extra work, um, doing the global parallel operations that work, um, but we need to restrict that to the cells, so that's the time within the cell you can do all that and then you get a time for sorting a whole complete, complete cell um, in O of that D, but you need to get things from one cell into the other, and um, then you can do something within uh, each of these 
cells and then do the, the right swaps. Um, so that actually turns out to be, when you do the balancing between uh, who needs to go to a neighboring cell, that is a uh, flow type problem. And you can do a few standard things with flows. You can, uh, if you have crossing edges, you can uncross them. And um, parallel edges, you can also uh, cancel them out. Um, so uh, what we need to do is deal with, with this kind of flow situation. And the important part is to see that uh, if we know that origin and destination are not too far apart within D, then origin and destination for a robot that starts in one of these cells needs to be in this neighborhood here because th those are all the cells that carry pixels which are within a distance of D. So that's good because we have a limited degree in this kind of setting. And uh, what we want to do is uh, organize the flow of robots that are not in the right cell yet, like this one. So we need to push one out here. There's somebody here, somebody here. So you see that's a circulation because the balance works out uh, in the end. You have uh, a full cell before, you have a full cell after. So you must have some kind of circulation here. And now what we need to do is realize these uh, macro pixel level, macro tile level, flows on the smaller scale based on local operations that are fast so you can do that in O of D which is that initial distance. And uh, you see there's a, a number of, of ways of splitting these flows and getting to the right destination provided they have the right order. That's where this crossing and uncrossing becomes an issue. And uh, then once all these flows here are lamin lamin laminarily arranged, you can push them to the adjacent cell. Um, so let's look at that a, a little more carefully. And um, this part is actually um, a standard network flow type issue. And uh, there's a theorem that basically says, if you have such a family of flows, um, you can do um, certain things that make sure um, that they um, can be uncrossed and uh, that they can be arranged in these kind of things. Um, and then uh, going back here, so this kind of thing where you get these circulations, um, then of course we need to um, do one more thing here, is realize that in the macroscopic level um, for for the existing flows here. So if you have a little thing uh, here, you, you, need, you have some, some other flows which go around in circles, uh, which may overlap. Um, the point that you can, uh, can work out is that you can decompose these circular flows. You take these circular flows and you basically, you peel them. So if you have this kind of arrangement here, um, you peel that from the outside and then you get a flow which goes like this. And you peel that away and the next layer is inside so it's not overlapping with this. And you peel that away and you keep doing that. So that's um, in computational uh, ways, that's pretty straightforward. And that gives you a decomposition of your, your whole flow into layers which do not overlap. And then you can spread that out and uh, decompose these um, and then realize these, indiv these individual decomposed circulations which are just there for getting uh, robots into the right uh, D size tiles. Once they're in the D size tiles, you can then work things out and uh, get these layers of flows and realize that uh, in, in your flow network and then um, you, this gives you this kind of decomposition into different uh, non-overlapping flows. And then once things are in their right tiles, then you can use the local swaps because then you're only doing things which are O of D anyways, and that gives you a constant 
factor and constant stretch. So that's the whole thing in color. And you can see here, I can then shift these things around to the next tile. And that is how you cross the boundary to the next tile over in this kind of mechanism. If that reminds you a bit of, of doing stuff on a Rubik's Cube, that's not a coincidence, but it's a, it's a huge thing and you have general uh, operations that you can do locally. So here's a simulator that does some of these things. Gives you an idea how the whole thing works in. So there are lots of things that happen in parallel. And then you can do some kind of rotation. So you arrange things and then you rotate again. So the outcome there is you, you do get a, a constant stretch, which implies a constant factor approximation. Um, at this point, the constants are still relatively large. It's a theoretical result. Um, but um, the issue is uh, you get some parts about scalability here for, for large swarms. All right, so that's, that's the kind of thing you do. That's what you, what you have. And you, you decompose that into these cells, uh, these tiles. You do the flow decomposition. Uh, do this kind of flow magic here, and then afterwards you can shift things over and then rearrange all these uh, inside of their own cells. And that's the outcome is you get this theorem that says um, you can do arbitrary uh, reconfiguration to, between start and, and uh, finish uh, configurations um, in any way you'd like. And uh, now that, of course, um, there's, there's some issue, of course, um, this is discrete and it's a grid. If you have continuous motion with continuous objects, things get a little messy and particular if things are really, really tightly bunched together. So there's a, a lower bound that says, if you have disks which are tightly packed, you can no longer get a constant stretch. There's a lower bound which depends on the number of disks that you have. And it basically looks something like this. I remember a, a really nice talk by Danny where he was talking about separability. So the important part is it's not density, it's separability. So this one is really close. Um, and this one has a lot of space. So getting these rearranged is difficult. That's easy, that has a lot of space. If these are planes in the air, you can just do that locally. And here you need to do a local, a lot of shuffling. So in this kind of situation, if you, um, want to rotate everything um, clockwise, counterclockwise. So each layer goes either uh, counterclockwise or clockwise, like this, like that. Then um, it turns out that getting them by each other is difficult because there's no separability here. And um, so when you, when you look at this whole thing and you spread this out a little bit more, you can make them pass by each other. Um, but that means you need a bit more space than you have. So uh, there's a proof which actually uses, considers a Voronoi cell of one of these disks and argues that this Voronoi cell has to grow by a certain amount uh, before you can get them by the others. And getting this extra space means you need to expand the whole thing by a certain amount, which means everything needs to shift, which gives you that lower bound. Um, that's it. Now, um, we also have an upper bound here, which basically says, well, you, if you can afford to spread these things out, which uh, may be stretching them out like this, stretching them up like that, um, you get, in this case, so now you're in a grid and now you can do things in a grid. Uh, and that's an upper bound of the square root of n uh, in terms of the stretch. The lower bound that we were able to prove is the fourth root of n. So there's a gap and there's an open problem. Um, so when you have these disks, really geometric disks, they just can squeeze by each other. And of course that allows you to basically use that grid situation again. So the grid result by itself is useful for also other 
more general geometric continuous motion um, there. Now, um, here's actually a surprisingly difficult challenge because the mission is you want the red disk to end up below the blue disk. That, in the end, that has to stay in the same place and that has to go here. What's the minimum time in which you can achieve that for, for disks at unit speed? And uh, you see here, there's a number of different pairs of trajectories. This is so that sort of the obvious one. You just take a half circle and you just leave that in place. That's a, an immobile obstacle, so you can do that. Here's something where you, you sort of do some shifting, a little more sophisticated. And that is really um, something where we did some, some numerical analysis, local optimization, and so on. We can prove that this is the best, but this is sort of the best we could find using um, no, uh, no holes barred, so any, any tools. And you see that's not something you would come up with right away. Let me just run this and you see how, how the uh, make span works out. So you see this one is done, shortly followed by this one, by that one, and that's the slowest, and you see that make span. So even in such a really, really simple uh, setting, really such a simple example, just get this one disk by the other, circular uh, bounded speed. We don't know for sure that something like that is the answer. Um, there's some calculus of variations involved, and you can imagine that if you have multiple circular disks doing complicated stuff, uh, life becomes really, really complicated. So that's that all these really nice things. Uh, for those who, who want to encourage students to look at the challenge if they haven't already, uh, there are a lot of interesting questions here, both in theory and in practice. Which gets me um, looking at the time, um, motivating you to look at these. Um, so obviously uh, there are some things uh, you can argue whether that is true or not. The transition for Elvis lives uh, you, you see that's, that's one of the benchmarks we have in the challenge. You see the colors of the robots correspond to their uh, starting position. So that, that deep blue one needs to go here, and, and so there's some, something. How do you organize that? There's a lot of space here. That's not really uh, one of these deeply challenging ones, but uh, of course you know that some transitions may be more challenging than you initially expect. Uh, that's the same number of pixels here. So how do you get a smooth transition from Trump to Biden here? And of course, for those of you who care about our conference, um, how do you get sausage 2021 to Buffalo? Same pixels, one of the benchmarks. Let me wrap things up with one more thing. And for that, I'll just show you um, the condensed um, summary of this in another video which is a collaboration with people who at, at MIT and at NASA and so on, which is about building things in space at large dimensions. And um, usually around Christmas, the last few years, we've gotten used to that. There's a new Star Wars movie released. Well, so this is something that happened this year. You may not have seen it yet in the movie, in the cinemas. It's not been on Netflix, but um, let me play it for you.
the largest structure in space ever built by humans is the International Space Station. Started more than 20 years ago, it has the size of a football field and took about $150 billion to assemble. Based on mid-sized modules that were transported into low Earth orbit and then mounted to the rest of the structure, construction required substantial effort by many teams of highly trained astronauts. Clearly, this approach does not scale. Even when avoiding the dark side. For example, with this prototypical solar panel. How can we improve the process to make it scalable? First, New, lightweight building materials are now available. When shaped into voxels, they can be assembled like building blocks. The second advance is the development of new, simple robots that can move on these super-light modular components. Because the robot architecture is simple, these robots could conceivably be mass-produced in space. These Billy robots are also able to move the lightweight voxels. Both manufacturing in space and making electronics robust to space environments limit the options for computing hardware. This presents a challenge. How can we carry out complex assembly operations based on very simple computational devices? In the following, we consider a model that focuses on the bare essentials. We consider a two-dimensional, connected set of grid tiles that form a polyomino. Our robots operate as finite automata. They can move around and sense, place or remove tiles. However, the robots move by walking on the structure and so must keep the tile arrangement connected. As a first task, we show how two finite state robots are sufficient to construct the bounding box for any given polyomino. A second basic task is to scale up a given polyomino. There are a number of other operations that can be carried out in similar fashion. More generally, we can implement any transformation that can be described by a Turing machine. In the following, we show how to convert an input polyomino into a physical string of tiles, which can then be processed in a Turing machine-like fashion and finally convert it back into an output polyomino. For a simpler visualization, we drop the connectivity constraint and show the bounding box as a special checkered arrangement that is separated from the polyomino by the indicated green box. We use a physical, vertical and a horizontal counter, allowing us to keep track of rows and columns. 
at the core of the procedure we scan the rows of the polyomino from right to left being a finite automaton the robot can keep track of a constant size neighborhood and transform it in a designated fashion in the following we show the actual transcription process we use two counter strips with corresponding start marker tiles we start with transcribing the bounding box note that the green color is for illustration purposes now we can scan the polyomino rows and transcribe them to the top counter Finally, the transcription is completed, as you can see here. I have a good feeling about this. So, um, that's the end of my time. Thank you for your patience. Sorry about the glitch in the beginning. You never know about these things. Uh, just this one bad luck where the Zoom session didn't work with the sound. The important part in this digital times is always to have a backup. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for being there. And like I said, it's a particular uh, honor and pleasure for me, after all this history, uh, to, to see uh, Micha being there, uh, and of course, uh, Dani is also one of the eminent figures in robot navigation, computational geometry, and robots at Tel Aviv. And uh, looking forward uh, to seeing you in person again next year, hopefully. Now, what I'll do is I'll, I'll cancel all this other video stuff and whatever else you have, um, stop the YouTube uh, stream, and try to reboot things so hopefully that I can be available uh, on Zoom for those of you who have a few more questions. Thank you. See you shortly, hopefully. <laughs>